Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. So I know I haven't been uploading much and I do apologize for that. Work has been filling up most of my time and I'm not able to play as much as I used to, but today I'm uploading a heavily requested video and that's an in-depth photographer guide video. Now, I know I'm a little late to this, but in a way that's kind of a good thing. Basically, everyone is so quick to upload guides the week after a hunter is released to get on the hype train. And although these videos do give you the gist of what a character does, these videos also do tend to miss some information. So I've been playing photographer since his release date, and I've also been the number one photographer in the NA slash EU server for a couple of seasons. So don't worry, I know my stuff, and I want to share all the techniques I've picked up with him in the last couple of months. Today I'll be going over Joseph, his weaknesses and strengths, strategies, and some helpful tips for y'all. This guide is for both beginners and experienced players, so if you'd like to skip over some topics, feel free to. I will include timestamps in the description box for y'all in the case that you'd like to refer back to this video or to skip over the basics, such as like his ability or traits. So with that being said, let's get on with the video. All right, so let's go ahead and start off with his external traits. So after Joseph takes a photo with his camera, he can replicate the survivors and environment from that moment and create a static camera world. Joseph can enter the camera world at will to find the survivors from that moment and place them upon a rocket chair. While in the static camera world, survivors cannot escape the, the manor or be sent back there from rocket chairs. Similarly, survivors in the real world can enter the camera world through recorded images. Survivors who do this can decode cipher machines for progress, but cannot decode them completely. Those in the camera world will not apply team buffs or debuffs to survivors. And then his special. After the camera world collapses, half of the changes made within it will be projected onto the real world, and there will be a cooldown during which the camera cannot be used. So, okay, it's a little long, it's a long intro into his ability, but I'll go ahead and break it down for you because it can get a little confusing. After Joseph takes a photo with his camera, he can replicate the survivors and environment from that moment and create a static camera world. With Joseph, he does get camera spawns as well, and with these cameras, you're able to take a photo to create a moment in time. When you use the cameras, you basically create an alternate photo world in which you're able to pass through. And within this photo world, you can find ca uh, photo clones of the survivors in the game from the moment that you took the picture. It sounds confusing, but it's easier for me to show you, so here you go. Like I said, you do get your own camera spawns, and we have one right here next to us. And also, you're able to walk in and out freely from this projection right here. So the gray area is going to be the photo world, and I do believe someone spawns right around over here. And through this world, this is where you're going to be able to find their photo clones. So let's go ahead and walk right here. Yeah, so right there, that's the lawyer's photo clone. Can't really do anything. Um, and since it's a bot, I do believe his real clone is outside, or sorry, his real self. So yeah, he's right there. And that's pretty much it in regards to that first point that they're trying to make. And now on to the next point. After the camera world collapses, half of the changes made within it will be projected onto the real world. And there will be a cooldown during which the camera cannot be used. What this means is that a survivor cipher will be reduced by 50% once the camera world collapses and ends. The only thing is that if a survivor finishes their cipher before the photo world collapses, then their cipher will not be reduced by 50% and just remain completed. And in regards to the cooldown of the camera, once photo world collapses, you will not be able to use the camera and take another picture for the next 45 seconds. And Joseph can enter the camera world at will to find the person from the photo and place them upon a rocket chair. While in the static camera world, survivors cannot escape the manor or be sent back there from rocket chairs. Again, this is pretty self-explanatory. Basically, if you chair a survivor, uh, a real survivor within camera world, their rocket chair will have no progression in sending them to the manor. I personally will rarely chair a real survivor in photo world because there's really no point, but 
you should share a survivor's photo clone in the rocket because it will leave the affected survivor incapacitated when the world collapses. And next one, similarly, survivors in the real world can enter the camera world through recorded images. Survivors who do this can decode cipher machines for progress, but cannot decode them completely. Those in the camera world will not apply team buffs or debuffs to survivors. So survivors are able to enter the camera world with the exception of mech's bot, in which they're able to heal photo clones or rescue them from chairs. Yes, they are also able to decode in photo world as well, but like the ability states, they're not able to complete it within photo world. The cipher will cap at 99% progress, and then it'll regress when photo world collapses. And now let's go on to space time. So it grants the power of two space times, regular attacks deal 1.5 times the damage. This is what makes Joseph a good hunter, and that's his damage output. Every hunter's normal attacks deal one damage, while Joseph's deals uh, that and a half more. It's difficult to heal that half a sliver of health without the necessary supports on your team, and that's what makes his traits so useful. In order to heal any slivers of health, you have to go um, and heal the photo clone just so you can have uh, ability to heal your real self. It's a little strange, but it's kind of how it works. All right, and now on to his abilities. So recorded moment, a recorded moment, which can be used while camera world is active. Joseph may use it to enter and exit the camera world freely. This is the first ability Joseph receives once he gains the necessary presence. With this ability, it allows him to use the photograph in his hand and it gives him the ability to jump back and forth between the real world and the fake world without having to use the portal projections emitted from his camera. This is a great tool, obviously, for jump scares, and you can also use it to walk through drop pallets or to camp chairs as well. And now, time jump. Joseph records the last 15 seconds in time as he moves. Return to your desired point in time by holding down the skill button for the corresponding number of seconds. This is the ability you're going to use to avoid looping, and it can also be used to switch between worlds as well. This is the second ability you require, and once you do get it, you will start to track footprints, and that's how you notice that you have it. And with it, Joseph will be able to spin the photo on his fingertip, and it'll allow him to relocate to positions he's already been in within the next 15 seconds of using the ability. The good thing about this is that the ability will highlight a footprint, showing you the location of where you'll be spawning to once you let go of the ability to activate it. In addition, Something the game doesn't tell you is that once you let go of the ability to activate it, you will be pointed to the nearest survivor as well. And that's why you'll see me in some games. Um, I get a lot of questions. It's like, why do you use your photo like that for like one second? And that's because it points me to the nearest survivor, like the camera. So that's mainly why I use it. Uh, unfortunately, though, if a chair survivor is closest to you, it will point you to them uh, as well as a down survivor, too. Other than that, it does point you to a standing um, survivor as well. So yes, it does point to Mexbot too, and that's what affects it. Okay, so now that we got all his background out of the way, I am going to begin to explain to you my persona builds. So the main photo build you'll see me using is the one which is down and up. I'll bring this build on smaller maps such as Red Church or Arms Factory. So let's go ahead and start off with Inertia. Going down to Detention, you do require Inertia, and that increases the attack recovery speed by 10%. This complements Photo's attack recovery very well since he has a really fast attack recovery. And like I said, you're going to be running this regardless because you do have to run Detention. We have Tinnitus as well. Receive a prompt when a survivor is within 36 meters. This is a must for every single hunter except for Feaster. And also, if you're wondering, no, Tinnitus uh, will not pop up for survivors' photo clones. It only pops up for their real selves. Next, we have Berserker. So I run Berserker on him, and almost every photo should, uh, and I do max it out. So attack recovery speed is increased by 15, 20, or 25% 
when Survivor is placed on a rocket chair. This is mainly used for camping since, like I said, he has a really nice attack recovery and Berserker goes well with him. So if you venture out far enough from the chair and you get a hit off a Survivor, you might be able to make it back in time to the chair to stuff a save. This is harder to do though with Merc or First Officer because of their abilities, but when it's any other Survivor, then it's really doable. Next, we have Desperate Fight. Basically, I had some extra points <laughs> from my persona left over, so I just used it in this. Desperate Fight, I used it because I honestly cannot stand Enchantress against Joseph, so there's that. She's really irritating against him since he's an M1 killer. But it basically increases the stun recovery speed after every stun you get, up to 60%. And now we have Wither. I wanted to mention Wither into this because it honestly doesn't get too much attention, but I really enjoy it because it basically makes the acceleration of a survivor slower when you hit them if you're 18 meters from a shared survivor. So imagine getting a hit with a really fast attack recovery and then adding this into it. Now we have Confined Space. I have recently started to bring in Confined Space and normally I used to not bring it with me considering that this perk negates looping which is something that you need to capitalize on with time jump but i have found confined space to make things easier due to the fact that if if it's your first chase and you don't have time jump accessible yet then you honestly do need all the help you can get to catch a survivor although consider bringing confined space against a cowboy or acrobat because obviously they can jump right back through the window before confined space activates and that just leaves you in a bad position we have Destructiveness. Now, Destructiveness is a perk that helps Joseph out a lot. Now, Joseph has a really weak chase game, so I bring this to help keep the pressure up. By increasing the pallet speed, you're able to continue the chase without much delay, and you're basically eating up pallets the second they drop it. Detention. And so, Detention, people might disagree with me and say, you don't need Detention on Photographer, but I have to stop you right there and say, you do need it. Some Photographers, they won't bring it, considering that by the end of the game, the Survivors might have like 0.50 to 1 damage applied, and a regular attack downs them, considering you already have 1.5 damage application on your attacks. Yes, this works, but Detention can save a game. If a Survivor is healthy with no damage, you're basically giving them the chance to kite you at the end of the game without detention. Alright, so now we have our persona build for the big maps. Now, in the case you're a hardcore photo main and you have no other options for bigger maps like I used to be, uh, well here's a persona that you want to utilize. Again, I still have detention on it, but I do run a right build instead. In this build, I have not invested into pallet breaking speed because of the fact that there's not that many pallets uh, in bigger maps and there's more open spaces. At least for now, we'll see how the map updates change that. So I also do have wanted order. With this perk, it'll highlight a random survivor once a person is chaired. There has to be three other survivors alive and they cannot be incapacitated. After someone dies on a rocket chair, then wanted order is gone. The reason I bring it is because it helps predict save routes if you get lucky and it highlights the rescuing survivor. If it doesn't, then you're kind of out of luck. Um, but I still do have Desperate Fight as well because, you know, these stun survivors. And now I have Hospitable. With running a right build, you will use Hospitable and it helps Joseph walk faster while carrying a survivor on balloons. This will mainly be used for the first part of the match when you take your first photo. You find a photo clone, hit the balloon, or sorry, hit him, uh, balloon it, and walk around to find other clones with your sped up walk around the large map. And finally, trump card. Now with trump card, personally, I was never a fan of trump card when it first came out uh, because I didn't think photographer needed it, but it is really needed for bigger maps due to large distance that you have to walk to get from one gate to another. So those are my persona builds. Feel free to change them around and with whatever you're most comfortable with. Honestly, it took me so long to find the perfect build, but I think I found it now. So like I said, it's personal preference and whatever works for you, go ahead. But if you wanna use this as reference, definitely do it. Now,
now for his switchable traits. So unless you're an absolute god at the game, then you will need to bring Blink. Blink does have a 150 second cooldown, which is a lot. But like I've mentioned, he doesn't have any chase potential at the start of a game, except for his pallet breaking speed. So you do have to rely on Blink a lot to get that final hit. You need to cut a chase short, and with Blink, you'll at least be able to secure your first shared survivor of the game. In the case you have, you're running Trump Card, um, switch from Blink to Teleport, so you can then patrol the gates with your time jump ability. Now, the best maps for a photographer are Red Church and Arms Factory, hands down. Reason is because these are pretty small maps which allow you to find survivors easier through the camera world. Other than that, Arms Factory is his main map because of the reason that this map only has one really bad camera spawn, but other than that, the other ones are so easy to walk to and you get there really quick. This map also has some dangerous camera spawns which are located right next to a couple of ciphers as well. So if the survivors aren't watching out for you in between worlds, then it gives you an easy terror shock or a free hit as well. Big maps, um, you know, such as um, Lakeside or Moonlit, uh, those can be a little difficult. They're not impossible. I've played on them, but it is a lot more difficult to find survivors considering of the distance that you have to walk and the short amount of time that you have until Photo World collapses. So... That's why you see you never see me really playing Joseph on those maps anymore as much as I used to ever since I've picked up other hunters that have better mobility on those maps, such as, you know, Bloody Queen. Uh, Feaster's also really good on there. Uh, go ahead, you know, play photo on the big maps. It's no big deal, but you are going to have to work for your win. So to end the segment, remember, bigger maps are harder for Joseph, but not impossible. And small maps are his best friend, especially Arms Factory. And now we're going to go into his counter characters. So we're going to discuss how a couple of current characters with their current abilities affect Joseph from the roster and vice versa. I won't go into every character, just the significant ones. So the characters that counter Joseph are support characters such as doctor and barmaid and to an extent explorer and perfumer, but I'll go into that in a bit. So doctor and barmaid. The reason that Doctor and Barmaid counter Joseph is because they're able to heal the slivers of health inflicted upon the survivors after one hit. Usually when you go into Photo World and hit a survivor once, you'll inflict the 1.5 damage, and after Photo World collapses, the damage is halved into 0.75 damage. Uh, all Doctor has to do now is find that survivor and heal them, making the survivor capable of taking two hits now instead of one. This is why you see doctors get banned by photographers uh, when it comes to tournaments because of the ability of healing that portion is so detrimental to Joseph. If a doctor heals a merc, he's able to rescue and without much chase potential, it hurts him. And again, barmaid is in a way equal to doctor except that she has the limited ability of healing considering she only gets two bottles to heal. Yes, she can heal faster than a doctor, but Barmaid can only do so much until she runs out of stock, while Doctor's heals are unlimited. On the bright side, a good thing about Joseph is that he can also counter Barmaid if she doesn't know she's facing a photographer. So when you take a picture, it'll record the health of a survivor, and every Barmaid has to mix her bottles at the start of every match, leaving her, vulnerable, uh, leaving her in a vulnerable state for a couple of seconds. So imagine you start off the game, right? Barmaid starts mixing and obviously she gets that damage uh, thing for a while. You take a picture and now she has to go back into photo world and heal her clone. If she doesn't heal her photo clone, then she'll be damaged and it'll force her to waste a bottle on herself and that's if she wants to. So what a smart barmaid does is they'll start looking around their surroundings to see if there's any cameras and to see if they should start mixing until the photo is taken. Once photo is taken, it is safe for a barmy to mix. Now, on to Explorer. So I know Explorer is a weird choice, but when facing a photographer, the Explorer doesn't have to deal with 
uh, cipher aggression because all they have to do is scavenge for treasures while the camel world is active and then they don't have to worry about the ciphers being depleted at half. Once camel world collapses, they can invest the treasures into a cipher and boom, you have a nearly complete cipher. You don't see any explorers in the higher tiers, but this is something to take into consideration for hunters that might find them in their matches. They're not really a huge threat, but it could still be a nuisance. And Barmaid. There is only one aspect of Perfumer that counters Joseph, and that's recovering from the damage dealt to her photo clone. So if you hit her photo clone once, she can recover using the perfume the second the photo world collapses. And this is why I always recommend you chair a Perfumer because she can't heal if her photo clone is, in, is chaired in the alternate world, so she'll simply just go down into an incapacitated state. In the case that you don't think you'll get her to a chair on time, I recommend that you hit the photo clone at the last second before photo world collapses. If done at the right moment, the perfumer might notice too late to act and the damage will be applied. And if that's not something that you want to do for some reason, just smack her and make her waste a perfume. Alright, now let's look into other characters. Now, these characters, um, they don't really counter Joseph. I'm just going into them because of their abilities. Um, you'll, they'll affect him in some kind of way. And with Mechanic and Seer, for example, there's only one thing that Mechanic does in which Joseph is able to capitalize on, and that's on Mech's main body when she's using the robot. When the Mechanic is using her robot in the real world, and you're in the alternate world, you'll be able to hear her using her robot. Keep in mind, she cannot use her robot while in photo world, so she will always be in real world in the case that you do hear her using her robot. It's not a glitch, it's an actual in-game mechanic, and the same goes for Seer and his owl. If his owl is circling a survivor and you're close to them through both worlds, then you'll be able to hear the owl making noise. Keep in mind, this is only for the beginning of the game, but it can be helpful for jump scares or knowing if a photo clone is in close proximity. Um, you know, it's happened to me before where I'll see a Mac, or not, not, not see her, but, you know, I will hear her using her bot in the other world, and same goes for Seer. With Seer, though, it'll rarely to never happen. It's only happened to me once in all the games that I've played, so, but you never know, it could happen to you. And now we have Coordinator. If a Coordinator shoots you, you won't be able to avoid the shot by walking into photo world or using his photo trick. As long as Cord is able to lock onto you with her gun, you will get hit. So, you know, don't try to walk into photo world like you think she's gonna shoot you and then she shoots. You walk into photo world, yes, everything goes to gray, but that shot, it still goes through. So just keep that in mind. And now for Mind's Eye. Mind's Eyes, they're able to see you through their radar above the screen. And this is what makes them a little difficult to jump scare a mind's eye is because no matter what world you are in, if a mind's eye stomps her cane down, it will not show your outline, but it'll show the Survivor Hunter logo on the radar. And now we have Gardener. So Gardener does have an advantage if it's early game and if you're trying to get a jump scare on her, considering she gets daddy's protection. She won't take damage or get terror shock because of the bubble. So in the case that you're not going for a jump scare though, then you get the advantage because her photo clone does not receive protection, aka the bubble. This makes it free for you to either apply damage or to chair her photo clone to make her incapacitated. Using this strategy makes her protection obsolete because by the time camera world collapses, her bubble will be popped regardless. And now we have Mercenary. So at the moment, Joseph is the only character that can terror shock and down a healthy, no damaged Merc due to his damage output. This also applies to a one hit when he has detention, like I said before, and this makes it great for clutching out games in the case that a Merc has to rescue, you're able to stuff saves easier than any other hunter against his character. Now, when it comes to who to ban, um, let's go into ranked matches first. 
So when it comes to ranked matches, honestly, personally, I typically like to ban Seer. It's already hard enough to get a hit with Joseph at times, and Seer makes it even way harder to get it down. Uh, you can ban Mech to slow down the Cypher Rush as well, but to me, she's rarely a problem, and she's also an easy down. Uh, this also goes for um, Prisoner as well. Um, I really haven't played against Prisoner too much, but he doesn't really seem like someone I'd ban. And that's why I'll always go with Seer. I have not faced a Seer in so long, and that's because I always ban them. And now, who to ban if you ever do find yourself in a tournament? I would recommend banning either Mech, Seer, Doctor, or all three, depending on what round you're in. Of course, Photographer is a hunter you'd mainly want to use third round, considering that there are other hunters above his tier. So in this case, those would be the three to ban. Uh, in the case that you'd like to ban Merc instead of a Doctor, which is something I have done in the past, you honestly have to be hopeful to find the Doctor first. Doctor is an easier down than other survivors, and if you find her first in Tunnel, her ability basically becomes useless to the team. The only thing is that the risk you're taking is if you do not find Doctor uh, at the beginning of the match, just know and remember that they're all in VC. So the doctor can literally ask, hey, where's your location? Can you ping me? And with a slight ping, she can find out where her injured teammates are and heal that sliver of health, um, making them a two hit now instead of one. So, you know, if you're ever in a tournament using Joseph and you find doctor first, then you definitely do have to go for her. Okay, so now we can go into his playstyle methods. So there's kind of like two ways that you can play Joseph, maybe three. I have yet to experiment with the third option, um, but here's two main ones, and it's mainly involved in his early games. Uh, his early game, sorry. So there is the searching method, and then there's the jump scare method. Uh, so let's go ahead and look into the searching method first. So. With the strategy, what you basically do is once you take a photo within a uh, real world, you're basically looking for the photo clones within the alternate universe. So, you know, you walk in through the projection and you start looking for the photo clones. You don't visit the real world because you're investing your time into finding these photo clones. And the best advice I can give for this is to memorize survivor spawns because it will really help. Depending on your camera spawn will determine how much time survivors have to hide so the sooner you can find a camera, the better. Make sure you're using your radar and listening to the in-game music as well. Survivors will hide behind pallets or within grass. Anywhere they can find, honestly, to be a good hiding spot, they will crouch. In the case that you can't see exactly where a survivor is, then you should be using your radar and see if a red dot appears. Follow the red dot and you'll find the target. The chase music will also initiate in the case that you do find a survivor. So if you don't see anything, but you hear the music change, then your camera spotted, uh, more than likely spotted a photo clone. So with this method, I'd say a good start is finding at least two photo clones with one photo clone injured and one photo clone chaired by the time the camera world collapses. So that for me is a really good game is, you know, hitting one of the photo clones, having them injured and then chairing the other one. If you exceed that then uh, in the game, then you should have a way easier from there on out. And now we can go on to the jump scare one. So this method is the one that I like to use sometimes, and it's basically where I will attempt to jump scare a survivor off a cypher. I know my team captain hated it, but I like to do it for personal reasons, and it works sometimes. So that's just me. The reason I use it though is because although there is a slight chance to terror shock, It'll usually allow me to get the first hit off a survivor by surprising them as I come out of the portal. The reason I do this is because it slows down the actual cipher progression, and at times, coordinated teams will decode a cipher with up to two to three people to finish it before camera world collapses. And if you get lucky enough, you might find the cluster of people, and someone is bound to get hit and ensue chase while the others now have to relocate to a different cipher. 
It's also my preference to chase someone in the real world at the start of a game. And if I get an early hit, then it slows down the mech's decoding speed in the case that there, uh, that there is one. So now she's forced to use her bot for decoding and I will also run the Persona Panic. And what this does is it'll apply the decoding debuff of 3% to the other survivors because someone's damaged. And Panic uh, won't become though, it won't become active though if a photo clone is injured. It'll only take place until after the photo world collapses and the damage is applied onto the real survivor. Keep in mind, this is a high risk, high reward kind of method since it's not always guaranteed you'll find someone at their cipher. And it's also difficult when you do have a coordinated team because coordinated teams will call out the location of the survivor if they're communicating through voice chat outside of the game and it'll honestly ruin your jump scare. Now with the third method, um, it's, I don't really have a name for it, but I have seen it in the comments and I've thought of it myself as well, is where let's say you don't take a picture at the very start of the game and you start looking for people, you know, survivors. Um, I just wonder how it'll affect the game style. And it makes sense because survivors might get irritated and be like, well, they're not taking a picture, so I might as well just decode. And if you take a picture, then it's easier, to find, it's easier for you to find survivors at ciphers. Um, but like I said, it's not really uh, a method that I've picked up or practiced. I don't know how practical it is. Might be something to try out later, but I'll keep y'all on check on that one as well. So in reality, there's basically two ways you can use photographer. Use each to your liking and to your play style. I do find myself using both methods at times. If I fail a jump scare once at the beginning, of the, like at the beginning of the game, then I'll revert back to the searching method and go on from there. Everything is very situational, so don't think you only have to stick to one tactic. And now on to strategies. So there's only a couple of strategies you should take note of when playing photographer, and that's being aware of your surroundings and the environment. You're basically walking through two worlds, and so there's things you'll notice where an action in one world affects the other. So for example, graffitis. As many of you already know, um, you can see graffitis posted in the real world through the photo world. Chest items. You can also see items being changed through chests. So if like a survivor like Doctor switches her syringe out with a wand in the other world, you'll see the change. Ciphers being popped. So ciphers within photo world will light up once completed through the, the real world. So that's how you know that someone's been lurking and they're decoding on the other side, is that that light lights up. And finally, or not finally, but crows. Um, please pay attention to crows. This is really important. Crows do not fly away from the hunters. They only fly away from survivors. If a bird flies in either world you're in, that means that the survivor is in the opposite world. The crows have helped me so much in the past games. And although rare situations, like they have helped me stuff saves as well. Most of the time, if you do have a survivor chaired, the rescuer will attempt to sneak up for a save within photo world and they'll pop back up into real world at the last second to get the save. So like this is one instance where it could happen um, in Red Church on Graveyard. There is a literal camera right behind the chair and there's also a bird or a crow crouched right next to there as well. So that's something that you can take into consideration too. Um, if you notice a crow fly uh, from the distance fly away and no one is near, that might mean that someone is traveling within the opposite world. Now going on to time jump strategies. These next strategies involve using the ability uh, time jump or what I like to call it the spinning card. So if you hear me, um, you know, calling it the spinning card, just know that I'm talking about time jump. So using it in camping, almost every single time should you be using the spinning card when you're camping. The card allows you to camp by being able to teleport back. You can use it to figure out how to um, predict save routes and to cut off saves. If for any reason someone is really good at like sneaking around, then make sure that you're paying attention to the icons on the right to see if someone gets saved or not in the case that you do venture out too far. And when that happens, just wind up the card, try to figure out the route, 
and if not, then activate time jump to get yourself back to the chair. You can also use it to pressure people off ciphers for a couple of seconds by winding it up. So when you visit a cipher, you should entertain the chase for a couple of seconds while still holding the trait of time jump. And then when you think someone is about to rescue, then let go of the trait and it'll basically teleport you back to the chair. We also do have looping. With time jump, you really want to capitalize on looping, like I've mentioned before. What I recommend is you mark your tracks uh, on around the area that you're chasing to be able to car trick back to that spot. So I don't know if you remember me saying, but with time jump, it'll highlight the footsteps. And with those footsteps on the ground, you want to basically make a circle around wherever you're uh, chasing. That way uh, you can be able to time, uh, time jump back to uh, how should I put this like the other side of the wall perhaps so that's what I mean about um, tracking your footsteps is you want to track your footsteps to where you think that you'll want to teleport back to when someone is looping you around an area um, obviously if there's no uh, if there's no foot uh, footprints anywhere um, and you're just going back and forth on one side of the wall obviously you cannot get back to that other survivor on the other side we also do have the time jump cancel. Uh, you can also use card trick to mind game survivors when looping. What you want to do is wind up the card uh, while looping or the photo. And what it does is it creates the sound effect of the spinning uh, photo. And at times survivors will start running the opposite way to avoid the teleport. And if it works out well, go ahead and cancel the trait and then get the hit. This doesn't work on everyone. Usually a survivor will wait for your ability to go off, but some people do fall for it. Um, and that's also something that comes in handy as well. Also using time jump on several characters. So for example, perfumer. When a perfumer is damaged and they still have perfume bottles at their disposal, what they'll do is they'll perfume early mid chase. By doing this, they intend to perfume back to their original spot after getting distance from the hunter. While doing this, perfumers will perfume right back before the hit connects. For Joseph, instead of swinging, what you should be doing is get as close to them as possible. And once you think they're about to perfume back, activate the time jump card and hold it for at least, honestly, like a second, uh, second and a half. Not too long because then it'll take you way far back. Uh, just a second or two works. This will position you, position you close to where the perfumer went back to, allowing you to get uh, that other hit. This tactic also applies to when perfumers use their ability on a second floor of a building and then they uh, jump down. So with Photo, feel free to uh, you know jump down with them and if they perfume back to the second floor, then you can just time jump back to them. And time jump also comes in handy against priestesses. Uh, what some of them like to do is they'll create a long portal and right before they enter the portal, you know, um, some priestess will try to go back through their portal leaving you on the opposite side. And what this does is that the portal does suck you in, so the portal gets destroyed, and you have to walk back all the way around to catch up to her. But instead of walking all the way around, uh, what you can do is you can use time jump after the stun recovery is over and get back on their trail again. So basically time jump just, you know, gets you back to their side to them. And also using time jump with exit path. Uh, this is the last example I have using card trick, or time jump, sorry. Um, and it's using it to get rid of someone's exit path. So for those that don't know, exit path um, basically allows for someone to pick themselves up from the ground when they're incapacitated once. And they can do, uh, they can do it once, like I said, throughout the whole game. I mainly use this technique for when I'm slugging to get a four-man kill. So uh, let's say I hit someone and they're down, right? And then I need to go get another survivor on the other side of the map. What sometimes uh, people, uh, survivors do is they'll activate their exit path really early and they'll get up on their own. But yeah, my footprints are still around them, so I'll just time jump back to them. Uh, but most of the time in the higher tiers, I do see people waiting for, waiting to use their exit path until the other survivor pings them saying hunter is near me. Or if they see that the other hunter takes a hit, then they'll activate their time jump because they know that I'm way too far away to even get back to them. So that's another example of using time jump. Um, and then uh, I just said that was my last one, but actually there is one more. And it's using time jump to camp two ciphers. So I honestly don't really practice this tactic too much because I am not too familiar with it. 
but I have seen uh, the former top photographer in the Asian server use it. And what they did is that basically you use time jump to mark your footprints at one cipher and walk over to a completely different cipher on the other side of the map. And then once you do is that you time jump um, back to the other one. And I think there's a 15 second cooldown on time jump or less. No, it is less, uh, I believe. But once that's done, you just keep time jumping back and forth, basically, uh, to one cipher and to the other. So you can camp both of them. It is a little risky because if survivors notice that, they try to like not linger too much around the ciphers. Um, but if I do find an example, I will go ahead and include it here um, of him using it. Because like I said, I'm not so familiar with the tactic, but I have seen uh, it being used in different situations for... Uh, for that person in that other server. In this segment, I'm basically going to show you and tell you why and how I do things in my gameplays. So remember me saying ARMS is his best map and reason why is because I literally found a camera right there two feet away from me, so that was pretty helpful. And now that gives the survivors little to no time to hide. Um, this is old gameplay, so the spawns might be a little different now. But basically, I was able to remember these. And that's why I'm able to find this first photo plume first. Uh, I also do apologize for this just because you can't really see that I'm in photo world. Uh, it's just, it's a glitch. I don't know if you need to fix that for the screen recordings, but it happens. Right over here, you see my camera going all crazy. I'm looking everywhere. That's because I, I can't see the survivor, um, but I do see the red dot right on the top left. So that's how I was able to find that one survivor right there. And then I do find someone else right over here, and that makes it a really good game because I already have three people injured at this point. Um, so I just need to injure that for femur now. And I don't find anyone here. The reason is because uh, so you see those survivors running towards factory. The reason is because they probably noticed that I injured one of the photo clones that was right near center. So they're like, oh, something near me, let's just, you know, transition. So that's mainly why you see them already out of that area before I even pop into the real world right there. I did blink here. Don't do that. <laughs> it's just me as a hunter. I don't know. I just have a tendency to waste my blink on unnecessary times. Uh, that's just something that I need to fix, but it comes with time, so don't use that. That was pretty bad. And I did get basement, so I, I do need to utilize basement to my best ability, considering that photo is really good in basement right now. More than likely, they are not gonna rescue, considering Perfumer is the only person that can rescue right now. And it's better for them to decode uh, and like probably save that last minute or last second uh, and rather than having to go rescue and have them have another one down in basement do take a photo right automatically right after you down someone because that'll slow down the decoding and if they get off chair you can always have them go back down someone's forced to rescue their photo clone if not they'll get incapacitated i also do like to time myself and you won't notice it here but uh, it doesn't show you right there on the bottom, but usually there's like a little timer showing when camera will be available. I like to time myself, and basically if I down someone right before I... If I down someone right before I'm able to use the next camera, uh, to me that's a good chase at the very start. But like I said, you can't really see it here. And then I also did know that someone was going at the last second, like I said. It is Perfumer right over here. It's a pretty risky thing that she's doing unless she has type and they can both get out of the basement but she wasn't able to get the rescue off unfortunately so she's forced to get out of basement and start a new chase she also did waste her perfume so that's kind of unfortunate as well considering that i get a free hit off of her and now she basically can only use her perfume to get distance off of me instead of just having to see like what she did right there that's all she could do right now i do eat pallets a lot um <laughs> that's the thing uh, i do i don't respect pallets too much um some hunt uh, some survivors they'll camp the pallets most won't sometimes it's just kind of like a half and half and then right over here you do see me going to merc because i did see him decoding but then i time jump back to this perfumer because for some reason i just assumed that she'd be going back to middle maybe 
NC, she conditioned me right there, so that was pretty good of her. She basically conditioned me into, so the first time she did drop that palette down on my face and basically that made me think like, oh, I gotta start respecting palettes now. And now that I was conditioned to that, she was able to, instead of camping the palette, she just kept running um, right around. And then the Merc right here, He's going for a really risky play. Like I said, he can't rescue because of his damage right now, his damage output, but he's going for it. And he went down because again, that damage output didn't allow him for, didn't allow for the rescue to happen. If he had gotten it off, that'd be awesome. He would have, uh, what he could have done is ran around the chair and having hit the chair instead. But I don't even then, I don't think he had enough time to do that as well. And then right here, I do have my tinnitus up. So that just signals to me that Mech is around. It's not her bot because, see, it disappears. Um, or actually, it might be her bot. I'm not too sure, honestly. She could have also moved it, and I do think that's what she did, is that she moved the bot somewhere else. Because, and later in the gameplay, you'll see that uh, it won't be there anymore. Now right here, I'm still, you know, camping, just looking around, basically. And I do pick up the Merc, but I'm not going to chair him because, like I said, I'd rather take the slug and get that four man instead of risking it and just, you know, having someone get hatched. That's just the way I play. You don't have to get a four man all the time, it's just my preference. And then right here you see that the bot's not there anymore. The bot can't enter photo world either, so... And then I do time jump back to him. And the reason I did that is because I... I mean, I always do that, but basically it was lucky because he did waste his exit path and he got up right on time the second that I time jump back. So it allows for me to ensue the chase again and have him get down. That way he has no exit path and I can just go for the mech. And basically my strategy here is get him down, no more exit path, look for mech and chair the mech and then run back all the way back to Merc and then chair him. I missed my blink. <laughs> my blinks have not been on point on this match, so do not take example from there. I did do that on purpose. Um, I whiffed my attack because I knew that he wasn't going to risk me getting the hit off, so that's what he basically did. He wasted another elbow pad, and that's what I wanted in the first place. And then he did elbow pad away, and I'm just like, at this point, um, I do time jump to see where he's at, and I saw that he was over there, but at this point I'm like you know what I don't even want to chase Merc right now like I'd rather just you know get photo world and incap incapacitate him through his photo clone basically and that's what I'm doing right here and then they were able to get another cypher off so they need one more left um, I'm pretty sure it's being worked on right now basically because I mean they have to get that cypher pop before camera world ends if not you'll get that 50% regression and it'll mess up their game completely you see the little pet right there, <laughs> that's from uh, the other world. And then right over here, they were able to get the Cypher's pop. I did see from all the way in the distance, you can replay that, but you'll see the elbow pads effect all the way on the other side of the gate. I did notice that, so I'm like, all right, he's over there. He can't get the gate open. He's already incapacitated, so that just gives me more time. And he also did use exit path, so there's nothing he can do. And then I found Mark, I mean, sorry, Mech right here, so even easier. And then there's no pallet here, so she goes down, and they realize that, I mean, there's no point, so they just surrender. But yeah, that's basically what's going on through my mind when I'm playing that game. Um, that's what I was thinking while I was playing, so I'm just trying to tell you guys, like, or give you guys reasoning as to why I do things. You might question, like, oh, why do you do this? Um, why do you do that? Like, that doesn't make sense, but in reality, it does kind of make sense sometimes. Blinks didn't make sense, but the whipping the hit so he can waste an elbow pad, like, you know, you have to take that into consideration. So that's pretty much it. If anything, I'll start reviewing more gameplays because I didn't even use time jump too much in this game at all. So I'll have to start reviewing other gameplay just to give you a better idea and sense of uh, why I do things, basically. All right, and that's the guide. So I know it's a lot to take in, but keep in mind, it did take me a while to learn all the things I know now. 
And yet to this day, I'm still learning about the game as I go on. Uh, I remember first playing photographer and wishing I had some guidance on how to play him. And that's why I created my channel because I want to educate you all on a character that got me to where I am now. If you ever need any help, you know, feel free to ask me in the comments. I'm always open to helping each other out. You guys know I always reply. And with that being said, I do want to say thank you for your amazing support. I love each and every one of y'all. Uh, good luck on your games and your journey to being the best player you can possibly be. So that's pretty much it. Bye.